Hello all, and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Tambellini Group Study, Security Gaps in Higher Education Uncovered. I'm Kirby Orozco, and I will be your moderator today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. All participants will be placed on mute during the presentation. Please submit any questions you may have into the Q&A panel and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This session will be recorded and we will email you a link to the recorded version after the event. Presenting today is Caitlin Ilkani from the Tambellini Group, Seth Edgar from Michigan State University, and Allison Buteau from SailPoint. Caitlin is responsible for guiding and directing the Tambellini Group cybersecurity research practice. She is an innovator in education and cybersecurity and provides strategic guidance to higher education executives based on cybersecurity best practices and emerging threats. She has a keen interest in analyzing emerging security threats and compliance issues. Ms. Silkani has been with the Tambellini Group for two years. Immediately prior, she was with IBM Security, where she consistently recognized her contributions in the field of cybersecurity with a focus on government, education, and healthcare. Seth Edgar is Chief Information Security Officer at Michigan State University, overseeing the information security and identity and access management teams. Seth has been at Michigan State for about four and a half years, building out their information security program. Allison Buteau is the Higher Education Account Executive at SailPoint Technologies. Allison has been working in higher education for over a decade, helping institutions solve complex challenges during digital transformations. Allison has experience in finding solutions for private, public, and for profit institutions. Today, she is focused on helping universities improve the student experience, secure their data, and applications, and meet compliance obligations. With that, I will hand it over to Caitlin to get us started. Hello and welcome. I'm Caitlin Ilkani from the Tambellini Group, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. I'm a senior analyst at Tambellini, which is the leading analyst firm dedicated exclusively to higher education technology research and advisory services. I live and breathe security research and recently graduated from Brown with my executive master's in cybersecurity. Identity governance is one of my favorite topics and it's becoming more and more relevant all the time. I have been researching identity in higher education for about two years and I also lead Tambellini CISO Advisory Services, where I help institutions like yours with their cybersecurity strategy. Today, I am so excited to share with you some of my research findings, while Seth provides his real-life, on-the-ground insight from his work at Michigan State. The data I will be sharing with you today is part of Tambellini's Education Institution Technology Profile Database which has over 500,000 data points about technology selections and factors influencing technology investment within higher ed. The research I am sharing is from a survey we completed in late 2018, and it paints a picture of how higher education views identity governance. Many of these findings may be unsurprising to you, but taken together, they illustrate that higher ed institutions are still struggling to fully utilize identity, which will become increasingly problematic in an era where constituents require immediate 24-7 access to services, security breaches are now a dime a dozen, and cloud first is a very familiar mantra. Let's look at the perspective we took with this research and how we are defining identity governance. Allison, over to you. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, what I'd like to do is take the next few minutes 
and talk about the perspective um, of identity management, in particular identity governance that the study was conducted in. But I also want to take the time to talk about what identity management has meant to universities up until recently, and then also in, and why that's changing. And so for the most part, what we've seen is that identity management has meant identity access management for universities. Um, and that's, there's been a lot of reason, identity manage, access management meaning to, uh, single sign-on and multi-factor authentication. And there's been a good reason for that because a lot of universities or all universities um, have to first onboard hundreds to thousands of students every semester. Um, anytime new faculty come on board, adjuncts, faculty, contractors, researchers, they have to do that in a short amount of time, and they also have to get them access to their data and applications before they start to teach class or start to um, go to school. So for the most part, identity access has, met, has made sense and worked really well. But things have been changing over the last 12 years. As in every part of our lives and all types of industries, um, universities have been deeply impacted by the digital transformation. So innovations that have occurred um, in mobile, creating mobile devices and applications um, and cloud technologies have been, had, had a great impact, positive impact at universities for connectivity and communication. But that connectivity has also given um, rise to a lot of opportunities for security attacks. And the reason for that um, is that today, a network firewall is just not enough. Um, hackers are now focusing on individual user identities. And they're doing that for two reasons. Um, first of all, if you think about it, on a university campus, there are obviously thousands and potentially thousands of different users. And one employee or faculty member could have access to say 10 different applications. Well, that now is 10 different access points for a data breach. Now take that one user with 10 different access points and multiply that by your total employee population or student population and you can see how that could just be um, endless opportunities to be breached. The second reason hackers are focusing on identity is because if they enter through a user's access, they're cloaked in that identity and can now maneuver around um, and not be detected. They can copy and steal information and probably be out of your system before you even know it. So, and this is just the reality of the world, and this is happening in all types of industries as well. Um, and many different, all business sectors are, are trying, are currently securing down their environments and their access, but as well as their identities. However, this is a challenge and is a daunting challenge at universities um, to do that, to secure identities. And it really comes down to a few different reasons, but mainly um, because the pure, the actual core of a university is its culture that is open and inclusive and sharing information. But it also, universities tend to have very diverse systems that are spread out amongst different departments with different sensitive information in, in the systems, as well as the dynamic user population using mobile devices, cloud technologies. And that complexity poses many challenges for university IT departments. Um, however, that complexity also makes universities very attractive to hackers. And we're currently seeing this happen, um, happen right now in higher ed where um, data breaches in higher ed are the third most common in any industry. So clearly focusing on identity access is just not enough to prevent identity security attacks. Today, schools um, need to be able to have deep visibility and control under their identities. They need to do that so they can mitigate cybersecurity and compliance risks, but also um, overall improve their user experience, access experience. And that's where identity governance comes in. Identity governance does this can, um, by answering three questions. Um, it, it, it asks who has access to what, who should have access, and how they're using it. Um, what I've seen over the last, well, as my conversations about identity management with university is that there seems to be a lot of confusion around what access is and what governance is. And so I like to use an airport analogy to help distinguish that um, or define that. 
So in that analogy, an airport analogy, I considered TSA to be the access management. They, on a certain day, give a particular traveler identity access to an airport or the terminal that day, a specific, um, it could be a specific bank of gates, but it's the airline that provides the identity governance. They are the ones who are actually telling TSA who could come into the airport or that terminal that day, but then they're also taking that and governing, taking the, um, that user and that traveler further along the path and governing their access to their final destination. They're telling the, the user or the traveler where they can, which gate they can enter, which plane they can get on, which seat they can sit in. They will have a connect connecting airport and another plane, another seat. But also, they're also even governing their luggage um, to get that delivered to them when they end their, their trip, but also they're keeping track of it with a manifest and then also um, a log in terms of the luggage. So, there are, very diff there are differences between access and governance, but both are needed at universities. Um, you know, if, by adding governance to your identity management um, plan, you are going to add that deep visibility and control. You'll, it'll help mitigate the cybersecurity and compliance risks, improve your overall access experience, but it'll also help maintain the open culture that's so important to universities. And it'll help discover um, more IT and operational efficiencies that'll lead to significant cost savings down the road. So as a, I'm gonna wrap up the, the, the definition or what is identity governance, but please keep in mind as Caitlin's taking you through the research findings, just the difference between the two. So Caitlin, over to you. Thank you, Allison. Before we dig into the research, I want to touch on some of Allison's points about why identity matters. In many ways, identity is the new network perimeter. Identities have become the central construct that threads throughout an IT infrastructure. And attackers have recognized this. If you analyze the steps that occur in a data breach, you find that they all involve identity behaviors or compromising identities at some level. So let's see what the data shows about attitude toward and funding for identity at institutions. You may see yourself in these findings. Let's get started. We sent a survey last year to all sizes and types of institutions across the United States. Respondents were primarily CIOs. 99 people responded in total, and about 50% of them were from institutions with less than 2,500 students. Now we're going to get into what they told us. We asked, what percentage of your IT budget is dedicated to cybersecurity? We know that a total of 118 successful attacks on educational institutions occurred during the first half of 2017 alone. And these are just reported attacks. They accounted for 13% of all reported breaches, with only financial and healthcare sectors experiencing more breaches than education. These numbers are alarming. Yet our work clearly shows that the majority of respondents allocate no more than one-tenth of their IT budget for cybersecurity. I have conversations with institutions every day, and I often hear how difficult it is to allocate resources to cybersecurity with so many other pressing demands. Institutions are struggling with cybersecurity for several reasons, and our data explores some of the reasons why as we get into later slides. We also asked respondents, what percentage of your cybersecurity budget is dedicated to identity management or access rights? Within their cybersecurity budget of the respondents, the majority allocated 10% or less 
to governing the diverse and dynamic user population to determine and control who has access to what, who should have access, and how that access is used you know, as identity governance is defined. So, Seth, what does this look like for you at Michigan State? Have budgets changed recently in regards to identity? Uh, for, for us, I mean, while, while the numbers change and, of course, different years are a little bit different depending on, you know, did you do a one-time expenditure or divvy it out over a number of years, uh, MS, MSU would fall into the second bucket there between 11 and 25 percent dedicated to identity management. Thanks, Seth. This slide is looking at engagement from the board. One of the reasons that budgets may be low is actually because of a lack of engagement from senior management and the board. One third of institutions still report that the board lacks visibility or interest into cybersecurity efforts. And I tend to hear very black and white responses from institutions on this topic. Either institutions are dealing with completely unengaged boards or they have boards that are demanding answers right now about cybersecurity. So it's a pretty interesting. That group that's saying yes is maybe looking at some pretty engaged boards and then we have the other side where you know, the boards just never act. So looking at senior management, this is also an interesting slide because not only are the boards not very engaged, a lot of institutions are dealing with unengaged senior management. And if your board and CFO are unengaged, how do you get budget? I did a podcast with Mike Korn, who's the CISO at the University of California at San Diego. And one of the big topics we discussed was just this, how do you get budget? Do you hammer your leadership with FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt? Do you try to focus on compliance? Do you wait until they ask, or do you bring it up? Our data shows that at 30% of institutions, the senior management still either never asked or almost never asked about cybersecurity. Seth, how does this resonate with you? So I think one of the biggest things uh, MSU kind of has to deal with, right, is the number of compliance spaces that we play in. Uh, so we, we're in numerous different areas, uh, be it PCI compliance or uh, HIPAA compliance or even just compliance with, you know, normal management of FERPA records. Uh, as, as a result, we get asked quite a bit, uh, we have a monthly status report that we actually put out about uh, cybersecurity, our cybersecurity posture. Um, but we also try and follow the news as well. So as new events come out, be it a published new vulnerability or a particular issue that might impact us, we try and get ahead of that by sending out some kind of a bulletin to, to senior level leadership. That sounds like a great approach. In 2017, I also did research where I was interviewing security professionals at institutions and asking them about their identity and access management practices. And this topic came up quite a bit. In fact, one IT director at a private not-for-profit four-year institution that was about 5,000 students told me that you know, they had identified zero budget for identity and access management. And part of the reason why was because the CFO was just unreceptive. And it was considered just completely an IT problem. Solve it and you know, don't come to us. They didn't want to hear about it. And I hear that from quite a few institutions that they're struggling with how to make this a concern of the senior management. The good news is that identity is recognized as a cybersecurity priority within institutions. 
And while the market is, exhibits a diverse set of solutions to address the spectrum of cybersecurity threats facing educational institutions, identity governance is central to any effective cybersecurity program. One reason for this is because hackers often target their users to gain access to high value systems and data, which Allison touched on earlier. Considering the sheer volume of digital identities accessing myriads of applications and data files, institutions could have millions of access points that translate into points of exposure. So I often hear that institutions have over 100 applications. Each of those could be an access point. Identity governance mitigates this risk by enabling institutions to see and govern the access right of all digital identities. 88% of the respondents in our research recognize the power of identity, but the application of the technology by institutions is still in the infancy stage. Let's spend some time on this next slide because it's very important. As you can see here, we asked, how are institutions using identity? Most respondents reported leveraging identity for single sign-on and authentication with very high percentages. The numbers dropped dramatically though, from 90% to 69% as we move from authentication to password management. Use of identity for provisioning and access for use decreases even further to 59 and 42% respectively. Within just these few data points, we gain interesting insights into the operational and security gaps facing higher ed. First, Password management enables users to change or reset passwords while enforcing strong policies across all applications and user populations. By enabling end users to perform password reset and change requests themselves, you can significantly reduce the burden on your help desk staff while improving the enforcement of strong security policies. Yet, Hamley research indicates that a third of respondents are not exploiting this capability to drive efficiency and security. This directly impacts user experience, drives up costs, and increases security risk. And interestingly, part of the reason we see single sign-on having such high adoption is because single sign-on has the most clearly articulated return on investment at institutions because help desk costs are, are so high. And password reset, having them the ability to not have to do password reset or to have a password reset done without having to touch the help desk saves significant cost. Second here, when we're looking at provisioning, provisioning under a unified and consistent governance policy allows institutions to avoid improper or inconsistent provisioning and deprovisioning. It further reduces delayed access for users and softens the workload for IT administrators and data stewards. Higher education is still in the early adopter phase of identity governance. And while our respondents were not asked how they were doing provisioning, we can draw from general knowledge and anecdotal experience. Many are provisioning via the functionality native to each individual application. In fact, I often hear from institutions that they are using archaic processes that diminish user experience and create security gaps. For instances, some institutions provision access by creating a ticket. That ticket is then forwarded to admins, potentially the help desk, who manually grant access to individual users. This is highly inefficient and not scalable. If educational institutions really want to protect data maintain an open and collaborative culture and improve user experience, you have to consider centralizing and automating critical processes. And this comes up as institutions have direct pain points, but also as institutions are increasingly moving to the cloud because business processes are shifting so much.
Here, we're also looking at access certifications. These are also critical in environments where the user population is dynamic and transient, like in higher ed. Reviewing entitlement rights regularly ensures that only the right people have the right access at the right time. And interestingly, access review only has 42% of respondents saying that they're, you know, they're using identity to do access review, that this is something that's automated within their institution. And because of this, you hear a lot of stories about how when institutions do something like a yearly audit, quite a few accounts come up as um, being abandoned but still having access and things like that. Now let's look at unified identity governance strategy perspectives at institutions. We asked respondents what percentage of their applications are part of a unified identity governance strategy. This slide and the next two break down responses between private not-for-profit, four-year and above institutions, public four-year institutions, and public two-year institutions. We can see that institutions are leaving security gaps around their identities. Disparate processes for managing user access to various applications can result in security and compliance gaps. Equally, or maybe more important, this same challenge can impact user access experience, which is critical when you're looking at a new generation of students, both Generation Z but also older students who are maybe today in the workforce but coming back to school for new skill sets have the expectation that a user experience should be effortless and immediate. For this reason, educational institutions should incorporate as many applications as possible into a unified governance approach. But our research suggests that all sizes and types of institutions are struggling with this. Here, we're looking at the private not-for-profit or your above institutions' responses to their unified identity governance strategy. And 42% of them report no strategy at all, with another 9% not sure what their identity governance strategy is. And this is significant when you consider that the respondents here were the heads of IT, director of IT, CIO. You know, some of them just weren't sure they even had an identity governance strategy at all. Given that colleges and universities are continuously onboarding and operating numerous applications, it's imperative that these critical gaps are addressed to improve user experience and protect sensitive information stored in applications and files. And I often hear how departments at institutions are purchasing applications that IT has no idea about, and then coming to IT asking for help in implementing and getting the applications turned on with the rest of the services the university is providing. So this unified identity governance strategy becomes critical because IT is being bombarded all the time with new application requests. So proactively having an identity governance strategy helps save a lot of time and money at the institution. This next slide looks at the same question, but for public four-year or above institutions. Of these, much less report no unified identity governance strategy, so 25% instead of 42% of the private not-for-profits. 20% of public four-year institution respondents also report that more than 75% of their applications are part of a unified identity governance strategy. Having as many applications as possible as part of this strategy and approach enables these institutions to align policy and centralize access control, automatically grant and revoke access based on training criteria, eliminate stale entitlements through automatic certification campaigns, which is critical because stale entitlements can be very dangerous, 
give managers visibility into what access their direct reports have, and also detect, document, and alert appropriate teams regarding any attempts to circumvent governance processes. And this comes into play when you have, you know, students, for instance, trying to access grading systems and change grades. I just recently heard a story about this from an institution where a student had been uh, logging on as the professor to change their grade. So identity governance comes into play with just as simple of a example as that. Seth, can you comment on what your experience at Michigan State has been like? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, across the board, um, identity is, of course, a, a really tricky space to, to get right. And, and even when you think you have your hands around it, uh, there's always a new fun nuance that comes along with it. Uh, especially at a university, though, it seems as though nobody actually ever fully leaves. Uh, if, if that's a student, they become an alumni, and the university wants to maintain a relationship with them for many other reasons. If they're an employee, they become a retiree who still comes back and teaches a class or two every now and then, or collects a pension, or has other benefits that they still need to uh, take advantage of. Uh, universities love, especially Michigan State, love to have uh, a number of partnerships with all sorts of other groups as well, be that for research, for support, for uh, just interaction, so uh, institutions even overseas for the sharing of data, et cetera. Um, as a result, of course, having a strategy that encompasses all those different user types, it's, it's very different than in a corporate world where you might have uh, accounts for your employees and accounts for contractors or other services coming in. There's lots and lots of varieties of uh, strange one-offs or specific use cases that uh, really having your hands around who is getting access to what in your institution is incredibly wide-reaching but also uh, small tweaks to any one of those systems can have large-scale ramifications for any of those different user groups. Thanks, Seth. Let's last look at public two-year institution respondents, which, interestingly enough, uh, falls between the answers of the private not-for-profit not four-year and above institutions and the public four-year institutions. You can see that 40% of public two-years identified no identity governance strategy, with about 13% not being sure. But here again, more than 20% of the respondents say that over 75% of applications are part of an identity governance strategy. So as you digest this information and consider how identity governance fits into your own institution strategy, you may want to ask yourself several key questions. Seth, take it away. Thank you. So really from the perspective of kind of everything that you, all of you have just seen, but more looking forward or at least hearing from uh, a university that is in the midst of a lot of these transitions, there's a number of things that really need to be taken into consideration as really as, as part of a shift in identity management and identity governance and in overall what effects are going to be uh, really seen as, as a result of this. So first up, really knowing how much each of your users have access to. And I don't mean that you need to enumerate all of this uh, for any of these questions, but more these should be back of mind questions for how do you get your hands around this? What types of answers should you start to be looking for in your institution? Um, specifically in higher education, there was and is a natural growth of IT and subsequent accounts. So. Here at Michigan State, we're no exemption to that rule whatsoever. Um, as 
IT grew and as computation grew across campus, different units had their own local IT people, their own applications that they would then stand up, and of course their own access accounts and provisioning that needed to take place into those applications as a result. Uh, naturally, being in different uh, departments, being in different areas, and sometimes just plain being different platforms really meant that the different applications themselves became disjointed. So while my account might have access in one area, it would have to be manually added in another, and you multiply that by 200 applications or so, and really it, it becomes a non-tenable problem pretty quickly. Uh, of course, the stakes are high, though. This is, you know, in, a, in the theoretical world of just, okay, there's applications and accounts, that's simple. But when we start talking about access to sensitive data or compliance-related data or any other space that you actually have to give answers to who has access to what, now this becomes a, a critical problem that absolutely has to have an answer. So either that affects your targeted deployment, maybe you focus on your areas that are the most sensitive or the most heavily used, or that, also, that means that you have to have really your access approvals and access request processes as ironclad as you possibly can. Um, the, the next question, though, uh, regarding the first day of users, this is, this is kind of a gut check question. So here at MSU, one of the largest problems that we have had historically is uh, the first day that a user shows up, one of the things that they needed to do was fill out access request forms. There was not necessarily immediate birthright provisioning where users just got access to that which they needed. As a result, of course, that winds up as a negative user experience right, right out the gate. And as we'll talk about on the next slide, uh, really getting that executive buy-in, making sure that your upper tier is engaged and, and wants this to be a success, if you get new executives or if those executives hire new people and it's a difficult process to navigate your identity uh, management solution, that's usually a bad experience or not a, a good sign for getting some of those, those funding pieces together. Or you can take that same negative experience and hopefully spin that into a conversation about what's needed in your identity space. But really that comes from, that's, that goes beyond just funding though. So as identity governance is rolled out throughout an organization, there are massive changes that need to be made throughout the organization, be that to workflow processes, daily operations, or you know just the regular challenge of hey, this is different than what we've always done in this space. Um, when you start talking governance processes and, and management of, of accounts overall, this is your people's access to the stuff they need to do their job. Their, their management, the executives, they have a lot of vested interest in those people being successful, and the easier that process is, the more likely those executives are to want to help to want to make it better, to think that things are on a positive trend. So those immediate returns as well, once you start this process, are incredibly impactful. Uh, as folks change departments, though, as well, um, at least here, individuals, they tend to go back to being a student after being an employee, or as they're a student, they get hired somewhere for a part-time job, or after I've worked in a department for a little while, I tend to switch to a different department because they uh, let me work with lasers, or whatever the case might be, um, that access and knowing who had access to what is even more critical when people leave organizations or when they leave departments and when they change over to different areas. Um, for us, it, there are some really natural changes that take place when a student becomes an alumni, when an uh, employee becomes a retiree. but. If your access management changes unit to unit in kind of that fragmented structure like I was, I was discussing before, you, you end up with really strange results. So for instance, here on campus we have uh, one of our larger units, about uh, 2,000 people or so, that their access management process was, um, you know, when somebody new would hire, they would usually hire in to replace somebody or backfill a position. The, the answer was always, oh, just give so-and-so uh, the access that their predecessor had. Well, 
that doesn't help if we never turned off the predecessor's access or we never go back through and turn off the access once that replacement is done in kind. Um, that asking for access also becomes uh, one of the key cruxes of this. So if the access request process is an arduous affair where nobody can navigate it, the results are pretty mixed. Those who know how to navigate the system or who have learned the specific way that you can get through the system to get access to what they need, they'll probably follow your processes. The people who don't, though, they will likely work around you or find a different back channel to get the things that they want. And as with anything in security land, the more difficult it is for a user to get what they need done, the more likely they're either going to work around you and do it poorly, or the more likely you're not going to be able to track the things that you need to track, either for access to sensitive information, compliance, or even day-to-day -day support for those users. One of the ways that we've tried to address this over time within our own infrastructure has really been to do about one week or two week post-hire interviews with new employees, really to find out did, how was it to, to get in? How was it to get the things that you needed? Was it intuitive? Was it hard? Was it simple? Did, are we missing anything? Is there anything to be added? And if so, then hopefully we go back to the drawing board, but often that feedback is mixed. So sometimes they'll say, yeah, I couldn't find it anywhere, and it was because something was missed in training or, or other things. So uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a pure metric of your access management process, but it is a really great way to know, hey, are we doing the follow-up needed to make sure that people are getting the access they actually need as quickly as they need it and is it tracked properly? Um, as mentioned before, uh, the harder security is to work with, right, the more it gets worked around. And you don't want to be in a situation, as the last question hints at, uh, where you're in the middle of an audit or after an audit and suddenly go, oh shoot, we forgot about this system that also has these records, or we forgot about this access for that group of users. It's never the time that you want to suddenly be realizing that you've, you've missed something. Uh, similarly, though, when a customer complains, you want to be able to answer those questions and get them the data that they want as quickly as possible. So that brings us kind of to our, I want to make sure, can, did, you, did that transition for everybody else? Are we on slide 18 for everybody? Yes. Okay. So that brings us really to our, our four primary takeaways um, for, for today's presentation. And that's um, really an identity and access management program is at the core of, of, a, of a solid information security program. And, and when I say that, I really mean that security, if you, if you think about it at the highest possible level, really thrives on who has access to what and whether or not they should. So compliance programs, cybersecurity programs as a whole have to rely on identity management and access management being done well and being done properly. Anything else that's not running on, on top of that principle is going to have some flaws along the way. Um, I view identity and access management as significantly more valuable than a penetration test and often <laughs> sometimes cheaper. But the really the, the core of getting, getting it right for all users having access to the things they absolutely need allows me to focus more on are they getting the training necessary for what they have access to? Are we certifying that they have the correct access for this year's body of work that they're supposed to be tar participating in? And of course, there's, there's a amount of work or a lift that has to take place in order for that to be accomplished. Uh, I have to put resources and, and teams toward managing that, that access, toward making sure users can navigate our systems, toward the care and feeding of our identity and access management tool set in order for that experience to be smooth and not just go stop at that single sign-on, as, as was mentioned before. Uh, that also means that there has to be some degree of funding that comes with that and some degree of upfront investment in order to make that happen. This is 
not a trivial thought exercise. It is counterintuitive to having numerous juxtaposed applications with different access and different accounts that may have to get into them. Um, the, the big thing for me, though, is making sure that, that senior leaders are aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it and why it's so critical for our organization. Um, at the end of the day, the goal is to change things. The goal is to shift things around in the way that we've been behaving, in the way that we've been operating. That means this will be foreign. Uh, this will be difficult. Uh, this will involve change, which is not necessarily something culturally that universities enjoy going through. Um, as, as a result, however, that upper level buy-in enables us to be able to do that. It enables us to continue that progress in making the place better and, and improving that experience. Overall for users, uh, yes, of course, I want my users to be able to get access to what they need and quickly, but also to show the gains made as soon as possible once the executives have decided to invest in that. Uh, we on our teams take a good number of metrics every month, as I alluded to before, that we try and get in front of our executives as much as possible. That doesn't work for every organization. Not every organization has leadership that really wants to know how logins are going. I, I, I don't mean that. But at the same hand, once an investment is made, showing that there's a return on that investment and showing that return quickly with something tangible is, is critical to the success of uh, really ensuring that the top level buy-in is in place and that we are consistently improving over time for our users. So there's lots of ways that you can, of course, go, go about that. Um, in our particular group, uh, we tend to take a lot of metrics on average wait times for customers and average number of requests customers have made and number of outages or interruptions or any of the rest of it. And um, I, I'd be happy to talk on that at another time. But uh, we are coming up on time, and I want to make sure that we also leave a sufficient amount of time for people who might have questions or for um, really just making this uh, an even more useful experience for any of, of those who are out there uh, listening to us today. Thank you so much, Seth. Allison and Caitlin, what a wonderful and insightful presentation. As a reminder, you may submit your questions at any time to the Q&A panel. We'll go ahead and kick it off with our first question. When is the right time to consider identity governance? That's a good one. Um, so really I would say that um, Identity governance is, is kind of one of those things that you want to enter into with, with thoughtful planning and with uh, hopefully some degree of committed resources to make that happen. Um, so, for instance, in our case, one of the first things that we did was we actually kicked it off with a study and a survey of how many different account types and groups and domains were out there on campus how many were currently managed centrally versus non-centrally, how many had an access management system, et cetera. So we started with data before we even began. But um, I don't think that there's any one right way to do this. Uh, many groups that I've either talked to or even here on, on campus at MSU have uh, said, oh, when we finish this large-scale project or that large-scale project, once that's done, then we'll start in on our identity governance process. Uh, the difficulty with that is that usually means that you just built a large-scale app or a large-scale tool set that now you're going to go have to go back and revamp how identity is handled internally to it. Uh, a big piece of this is ensuring that IT as a whole views identity as a stakeholder at the table and as a, part, uh, as a partner and a group to work with as they do deployments. So some of that is getting your ducks in a row. Other pieces of that, of course, are ensuring that the tool sets are out there so that as new projects and new technologies come on board, that they're following similar processes. Thanks so much for that. Our next question is, how does cloud transformation impact an identity management strategy? Uh, 
Uh, Allison, do you want to you want to start that one off? Sure. No, sorry, it was on mute. Um, well, I would say this: what I I find um, in my conversations a lot with universities that there there are they have a um, they are considering um, cloud. They have an initiative, and they're some of them are, are not. Um, as cautious about it than one would think. But when they're planning their identity management strategy, it seems to be a bit disjointed um, with that in mind, you know, with that kind of cloud initiative. Um, from the viewpoint of this is that the very nature of a SaaS solution is going to be configurable, not customizable. And there are many great benefits that come with that. Um, you can reallocate resources uh, from your IT resources um, to other places because you're going to need as many people to manage it. There are different microservices um, that uh, be provided. Your updates are automatic. Um, but what I find a lot is that when you get into the strategy of their identity management, they're not ready to, they have workflows that are, they're not ready to change and or they're not flexible. And so it usually comes down to, um, you know, can you, are you willing to make those changes to be able to have all the benefits of what you're trying to achieve in a, in a cloud strategy? So it, it's, it kind of comes to a conversation at some point where we really have to take a step back. Um, and sometimes they can, universities can make that change and are, are open to it um, to change their workflows. Um, and, and then some art. So that's, that's just one that comes to the top of my mind right away. What about you, Seth? Uh, I, would, I would agree. Uh, I would say that, you know, at, at least from, from our experience here, here at MSU, um, a large piece of it has to do with um, whether or not we were ready to handle things in the cloud. So uh, there are some areas where the cloud makes sense and some, some where it doesn't, right? And uh, knowing that you have your hands around your identity strategy as a whole is sometimes more important than uh, knowing where those applications are going to live. Uh, that said, we did have to adjust the mentality of the university quite a bit towards whether or not uh, cloud and cloud identity management or cloud services with their own identity components, how those would interface with, with our access management strategy, with um, Overall, how would we handle identities in the cloud? How would that map to what we do here? Does it change? Is it different? Is, you know, and, and it's usually your first large application that is in the cloud where you have to answer a lot of those questions if you haven't answered them already. So um, for us, it was very much a, a question of making sure that we adapted our strategy to be generic enough to meet cloud needs when automated deployment models or uh, tool sets for uh, single sign-on usage, et cetera, might not have been as intuitive or straightforward to simply tack right on. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Our next question is a bit of a big one. How much dedicated staff do we need to manage a solution like this? Well, um, I'll just uh, make a few comments on that, and Seth, please chime in as well. Um, you know, it, it, <laughs> I hate to say this, but it depends. It depends on the university and kind of where you're at. It, and it depends, too, if you're looking at an on-prem solution or a cloud solution. Um, it, you know, we've seen universities that um, have teams of 10 people. Uh, I have a team of 10 people, I'm sorry. And, you know, or down to a few to manage an on-prem. And that just depends on the complexity of what you're going to be undertaking with your identity governance solution. But um, we're versed in a, in a SaaS uh, scenario, you know, you might need one or two. And that's just from the kind of perspective of, of my conversations with universities. So it's not, there's not one formula. I would just say you have to understand the difference between an on-prem choice and a staff choice and what that's going to mean, um, the responsibilities and resources you'll need for an on-prem solution and the team to manage that if you do that. Seth, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it, it really depend, depends on what you're doing in governance as well, right? So mm -hmm. 
it very well may be that I, I don't know if there's a single one size right that that works or a minimum number of people that um, I tend to see on you know on vended solutions and things like that must have X number of people for this deployment to be successful and, and those sorts of things I think the mileage varies on that um, and it, and it kind of depends are you only doing access requests are you only as, as we saw so many institutions are all over the map on what they do in identity space overall that it's kind of hard to answer that as far as a uh, must have two FTE dedicated. Uh, I can say here at MSU, yes, we do have a dedicated staff. We actually have a, a number of teams uh, dedicated to different portions of this, uh, be it identity engineering, be that uh, single sign-on work, should that or be that access management and requests, or even uh, walk up questions and, and things along those lines as well. So it really, I mean, it very much depends on what portfolio you're also supporting for your user base. Mm -hmm. And Seth, just to be clear, that's your staffing required to run SailPoint? Uh, it's, it's not just SailPoint. So uh, we, we have uh, a mix of all sorts of things. So actually, uh, that, that leads in somewhat well. I see one of the, the questions on the chat here from, uh, from Steve. Um, regarding is SailPoint being used at MSU to support all of our identity governance. And, and the answer to that is it's, it's mixed right now. We are in a, a replacement right now of some of our on-prem uh, homegrown solutions and using different functions uh, within SailPoint for things like provisioning, access requests, uh, stuff like that. So we, we are in a transition right now um, between some of our homegrown solutions and supporting those and others. Uh, but the staffing is, it's, it's the same set of teams running multiple solutions. Thanks so much, and we appreciate all the detail uh, giving your insight into that, Seth. Um, another question is, what are some of the most common pitfalls of revamping identity management in high red? And I think perhaps all three of our panelists can give their insight into this question. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just kind of start off with that. Um, from the, my perspective um, and what I've seen just in my discussions, you know, being at sale point with universities, um, I would say trying to do too much at once, um, trying to, to, um, to do every use case at, in, in the first phase, um, what makes, I think a good approach and makes it more realistic and manageable is to keep it simple and have a phased approach. Um, something else I would just add as well is that I think it really is important before you even get to that place um, to understand that to get to develop a phased approach is to really have a deep understanding of your current system and your needs and what that new infrastructure should be. And that um, is great too. There's a lot of, uh, you can have assessments done, you conduct one yourself, SailPoint can do one. We have partners that do that work as well. But um, that can really create a roadmap that's going to take a lot of the, um, that'll make it your, the process more efficient to deploy any identity governance um, management plan, um, but just less painful as well. Um, and the other piece I just add is, is um, which Caitlin talked about um, in, in the research study. It's just, it's, it's really, and Seth mentioned it too, important to have upper administration involved as well and supportive. So I, I, I'm sorry, I mentioned a few things, but, but Seth and Caitlin, please add your thoughts. Sure, Allison, this is Caitlin. So, some of the things that um, I see coming up is that people underestimate uh, the impact on their end users of identity governance and really should be thinking about both how it will enable your end users to do more and get access to more things, but also, you know, what is the process to get a solution implemented because your identity governance platform will touch many, many applications. 
And you have to be very thoughtful and scoping this project before you ever embark on it. Um, Seth touched on this too, really looking at what are you going to do and when and whiteboarding out, you know, basically an architecture before you try to just jump into an implementation um, because it will require a lot of your, of your staff and your budget and be you know, deeply touching so many pieces of your, of your IT application. Yeah, and, and to echo that, I think one of the, the biggest pieces that, that we are encountering currently and have in the past is appropriate scoping. And uh, as, as was touched on right at the beginning, that, that phased rollout. So, I mean, this is a multi-year multi, uh, multi undertaking usually to, to get this fully replaced, especially in a large-scale university setting. There are so many accounts and so many varied use cases and fringe cases and other pieces to this, usually replacing old that uh, old practices and other things, that, that executive buy-in is, is huge, the investment is huge, but it's making sure that you're doing it in chunks that you can actually show that growth and show that change over time that, that really um, make it a, a worthwhile endeavor overall for the entire university to see, right, is, is doing it, doing it well in those pieces to make sure you solve for the largest use cases as you go. Great. Thanks so much. Um, that's about all the time we have today. I see there are a few other questions, uh, but we will go ahead and follow up with everyone. I'll hand it over to Allison to go over next steps and suggestions for everyone. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, we really appreciate everyone joining us today and participating in submitting the questions, and we certainly can answer those offline. Other things I think that could be helpful or of interest, um, we are, we're recording this, so we can, we can send that out as well. Um, we have a very interesting case study. It is about one of SailPoint's clients, Norwich University, which um, is using our SaaS solution, um, which we'd um, be more than happy to share that. And also, we can um, offer, we can request to do and, and schedule time to do some consultation with you or, um, and also just show you a demo of the product um, and just be a thought partner in your process as well um, as you're trying to, you know, scope out which could, which that's, is, I think we've all kind of hit the point of, you know, a tricky, complicated um, identity management process. So. Um, with that, I think we can wrap it up, but please um, please reach out and, and with any questions and we can forward the recording in the case study as well. So thank you so much today. Yes, Caitlin, Seth, and Allison, thank you for your time in this presentation. And thanks for everyone for tuning in today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.